Introducing Royal Caribbean's newest ship, Icon of the Seas, the ultimate family vacation. The ultimate six slides, eight neighborhoods, zero compromise vacation. The ultimate never done that, can't wait to do it vacation. The ultimate chillin' by a different pool every day of the week vacation. This is the Icon of Vacations. Icon of the Seas, arriving in 2024. Book today. Come seek the Royal Caribbean. Ships Registry Bahamas. Topo Maps Plus is one of the world's leading backcountry navigation apps, turning your phone into a fully functional GPS unit. Backroads Maps Books is proud to offer maps as an in-app purchase for Topo Maps. This makes it super easy to download mobile apps for offline use. This way you can get accurate and reliable GPS tracking and navigation while out of cell and data service. With Topo Maps Plus, you can view your location on the map, add waypoints, trace new routes, measure distance and elevation, change and share your tracks with your friends, you know, once you're back in service. Never get lost with Backroads Maps. Okay, guys, I, uh, I don't know what to say. Uh, anybody who uh, listens to this show, sorry for kind of being absent for a while, but uh, I recorded this uh, this episode with uh, Baker Levitt uh, back in August, and I'm just getting it out to you guys now, so a couple, uh, couple months behind here, but uh, maybe as things slow down here, we'll get, uh, we'll get back on track. But uh, anyway, welcome to another irregular episode of the Focus Hunting Podcast. Um, the Focus Hunting Podcast is brought to you by the Waypoint Outdoor Collective. For more on Waypoint, head on over to waypointtv.com. Check out what uh, what they got going on over there. Lots of good stuff. Now, uh, like I mentioned, I'm uh, I'm joined today on this episode by Baker Levitt of Black Rifle Coffee. Um, for those of you who may know uh, Baker, you might have heard him on other shows. Um, he's a great guy, but uh, one thing about uh, Baker, well... He's, uh, well, let's just say um, he's a guy who, who you always know what he's thinking. Um, anyways, uh, we got uh, we got a good uh, good conversation him and I get into here, so hope you guys enjoy it. And, uh, and I got another one here I've already recorded, so I'm going to get it out to you guys uh, ASAP. It's with uh, Dan Staten of Elk Shape, so get, uh, get that uh, over to you guys soon. But for more on uh, Baker and Black Rival Coffee, you can hit up Baker at... Uh, over on Instagram, he's got uh, he's got tons of great stuff on there. So make sure you click on his his stuff and follow him. He's at Black Baker. Uh, just type that into the search and and he'll come up and uh, and head on over to Black Rifle Coffee. You know, if you guys haven't tried it already, it's some some great stuff. You can find them at BlackRifleCoffee.com or .ca. So how you doing, man? I'm fantastic. How about yourself? Oh, I'm doing okay. I'm uh, I'm so far behind and everything. I think uh, I think I'm winning sometimes. Yeah, I, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. No doubt. So what's uh, here down in Florida? I am. I live in Ormond Beach, Florida, which is about 10 miles north of Daytona. Um, I live like six miles from the racetrack. Nice. And uh, it's hotter than three hells down here right now. Like the past couple of days, it's just been brutal. <laughs> uh, but that's good. Getting ready for uh, upcoming uh, bow season, hunting season and you know. Like I'll be in Western Nebraska and then I'll be in Colorado. So as long as I can acclimate to the elevation, I'll be fine. But as far as like being comfortable in the heat and all that stuff, like I'm, that's a dry heat's a joke, you know, once you come from this humid stuff that I live in. Yeah, no doubt, man. I lived, uh, I lived on a coast for, for quite a while. I mean, we didn't get a lot of sun up, up in Northern BC, but, uh, I live down in the Southern part of BC now. So it's, uh, it's a lot warmer down here, but, uh, Right now, you wouldn't believe it with all the damn smoke we have. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, I heard that. Um, you know, it's also interesting about living like in on coastal, like on the coast, and like where it's humid and stuff. Like, not only is it hot, it's hot, but the cold, colders are a lot cold. You know, yeah. Um, you, you feel it in your bones. You know, like it just kind of seeps in there and gets in like the cracks of your clothes and just sucks it out of you. Yeah, man. I, I fished. Yeah, definitely. I fished. Uh, I commercial fished off the uh, off the north coast of British Columbia um, for almost ten years. So I know all about that dam. Uh, what did you guys dam. catch? Uh, we fished uh, halibut, uh, crab. Uh, did some dragging out there. Um, uh-huh. so. What's the biggest halibut you've ever seen? 
Uh, just over 400 pounds. Jesus. My buddy, uh, Mike Clancy, who works for Black Rifle as well, um, when he got out of the military, like uh, he was home from a deployment and um, like helping this dude like build a cabin up in Alaska, just something to kind of, you know, get off the grid and just kind of, you know, get back into reality. And like every afternoon, they'd kind of go out with these like uh, tuna sticks to shoot super short fishing rods and catch a halibut or whatever for dinner, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And um, he was just using like a, like a sluggo or something and uh, slung it out there and like laid into like a 400 and something pounder. It was like almost a state record. He's, I'll, I'll send you a photo. Um, absolutely mammoth, like barn door looking thing is well over 400 pounds. Um, completely insane. Insane yeah. fish. Delicious fish too. Yeah, man. They, uh, they're, they're something else. They get uh, they get pretty damn big. Yeah, I've seen uh, a fair share of halibut. Uh, so, what are you hunting for out in? Uh, where are you going? Nebraska, Colorado? What are you doing out there? Uh, on September the eighth, I start with uh, it's a western mule deer hunt, um, western Nebraska mule deer hunt. It's archery, um, and uh, so I got that. That's with the bow, and then um, on. So I'll be out there for a week. Pretty excited about that. There's still, they'll still be uh, running around in velvet at that time, which I don't care. Um, mule deer hunting to me is, is pretty new. It's a new species. Uh, I've killed two. I've been, I've hunted for them four times with the bow. So um, still, you know, relatively new to that. Uh, he said there's like a 94 success rate. It's semi-guided. Um, but I'm pretty jazzed. I don't care if it's velvet or hard horn. I don't care. Just a nice buck. I'll be super jazzed on. Um, and then, uh, I come back and then our farm in Georgia, uh, season opens on the 11th. So that next week and I'll be hunting whitetail in Georgia with my bow. And then I leave, uh, for a Southern Colorado elk hunt at the, on the Hill ranch with Eastman's. Uh, hunting journals that's on september the 24th that's a rifle hunt for elk super jazzed about that and then um i'll do uh a whitetail and an axis in texas this year as well and then i've got a um a hunt in missouri i need to kind of get sorted out i put a deposit down on a hunt a few years ago and i need to follow up with that oh cool man busy uh busy september yeah, it did, but it's not as busy as it used to be. Like, I used to just, like, I don't know, man, it was my goal just to go out and travel as much as possible and hunt as many different states as possible, and, like, that was what I did. And then I just realized one day that I really, really hated that. Um, like, I, I didn't like it. I just did it because I thought it was cool or I needed to be doing it or people expected me to be doing it, you know? that really wasn't what I wanted to be doing. And so I just kind of pulled back um, from doing that. Like, I'm, I mean, like, dude, I'm, I'm pretty much a homebody dude. Like I really like being home. I like being here with Melissa. Like we have a really good life, comfortable, super happy. I really enjoy it. We live in a small beach town. Um, and so, you know, most of my hunting now in the fall compared to years past is done at the farm in America's Georgia. So that's like four and a half hours from where we live. So we just go up there, you know, on a Thursday and head back on a Monday and spend a lot of the time up there just chasing whitetails. Um, I had, I had a guest on before he was telling me, what the heck did he say? You're allowed 10 deer out in Georgia, something crazy like that. Well, 12 deer. Yeah. Yeah. It was something I couldn't believe it. I mean, here in BC, we're allowed, uh, we're allowed two whitetail, but, uh, um, yeah, 12 is so I think he said you're allowed what uh, eight does and four bucks or something like that. No, it's ten does and two bucks. Oh yeah, ten and two. Okay. And and they want you to shoot twelve deer, like they really. Is that really right? want you to, oh my dude, it's like. So we started this nonprofit called the Hunter Recruitment Project last year, um, and you know Jamie Shira, my buddy, was like, "Hey, I want to take people hunting on the farm that have never been," and you know like when you're managing a whitetail population, you get depredation tax as well. If you have agricultural land. And so 
you want your buck to doe ratio to be in balance because if you have too many does, your bucks will run themselves ragged during the rut and run themselves into the ground and kill themselves. Right. Yeah. So you want your ratio to be one buck to one doe, one buck to one and a half does. Like that's really the ideal scenario. And so just over the years, dude, I've been hunting whitetails for 30 years. I've just, I've shot so many whitetails in my life, like lots and lots of them. And, um, we wanted to give the opportunity for other people to do it just because like, I'd rather see someone that's never killed a deer. I don't, I don't care about shooting a doe. I've done a hundreds of them. I'd rather let someone else do it. And so, um, you know, we try to get as much of our doe population harvesting done as early as possible in the season, you know, just cause you want everything to be calmed down. You don't want them pregnant and all this stuff. You just kind of want to get them out of there. And so um, that's kind of the, you know, the deal. And then like, you know, it's also cool because, you know, you donate the meat to hunters for the homeless, hunters for the hungry. Oh yeah. What's that all about? So well, actually first, how, how long is your season down there? You said you want to get it early. How long is that your whitetail season? Uh, September the 11th to the end of January. Oh, wow. Yeah. I thought yeah. Uh, we, we've got uh, <laughs> September 1st to December 20th here for whitetail. I thought that was crazy long. Yeah. So, and also you just got to keep this in mind. Like, so if you can successfully hunt a mature whitetail buck with a bow and kill it, you can hunt anything on this continent because they're the most skittish animals I've ever seen. Like they run from each other They're because they're constantly being, the hunting season is six months long. Uh, the, the, the take quota is super high. So you've got people managing private land and all that stuff. And like, they're just constantly being, you know, pursued and harassed. So um, they're super skittish animals, but it's my, one of my favorite things to do, but um, back to the hunters for the hungry. So what hunters for the hungry is a nonprofit. And what you do is you take deer that you've shot and you take it to the a, a qualifying processor and they grind it up and process it and then give it to the local food bank church you know, people oh, yeah. in need, less fortunate. And it, I think, man, God, how much we donated last year, several thousand pounds of venison. Wow. Yeah. I mean, and, and that's a cool feeling, you know, like, and if you look at modern technology and trail cams and social media and hunting television and all these magazines and like, there's really no pride in meat hunting anymore. All right. It's all trophy buck this, trophy yeah. buck that. What he score? What you shooting yeah. with? Is it on public private land? You know, blah blah blah. Oh, dude, there's there's so much shit for that. Like uh, DI and like this whole DIY. Uh, yeah. You know, it has to be done this way. It has to be done that way. And then the fucking squabbling between guys. If you're not doing it the way they think that it should be done, yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah. Cool. It, and you know, uh, Ted Nugent, who I think is is kind of a nut job, but you know, he makes some sense sometimes. He said, how dare you criticize someone's deer? So you don't know who that person is. You don't know their situation. Maybe it's a kid who was home for college. He had one day to hunt and all he had the opportunity, that was it, was to shoot that spike or that small buck or, or that doe. Um, and, you know, he wanted to take the meat back to college so he'd have food to eat and whatnot. And um, there's just a lot of people, this holier than thou locavore individual that was created. And I am a huge Stephen Ranella fan. Um, that whole do it yourself, only hunting on public land, like that's how it was created. Like the whole backcountry hunters and anglers group, you know, where if, it, if it's on public land, it, do it yourself on public land with a bow. And if you didn't, if you did it any other way, it doesn't count. Well, fuck you. You know, like it's not my fault. And I, and I will not apologize for my family owning property. Like no, never, will never ever po apologize for my family being successful. No, and man, I'm jealous farm. of those who do. <laughs> like, I'd love to, I'd love yeah, to be it, able to it, swing that. Yeah. And you hear people like, Oh, you know, that's his daddy's land. And it's like, all right, man, like, you're going to criticize this dude because his father is successful. How does that fucking work? Like, who are you? What'd your dad leave for you? Like what kind of guidance did your father leave? You know, like 
it just the whole thing. It's just toxic. Like meat eater yesterday, like Stephen Ranella, um, and like I said, I'm a Ranella fan. Um, they had uh, Tucker Carlson on his uh, podcast talking about fly fishing. The n- over a thousand comments of people absolutely losing their mind, um, and it's like these people think that they have this. You know, like when I was growing up. So I'm 45. So dude, when I was growing up you had to earn the right to have an opinion and you had to earn the right to have your opinion heard. You know, um, not anyone got to have an opinion or voice it. And so, but now with social media and all this other nonsense, anyone can have an opinion and anyone can go online and talk shit. Like that's another thing. When I was growing up, when we had the internet, like you talk shit, there was going to be a confrontation at some point and you're going to have to back up your words. Oh yeah, Um, definitely. You couldn't hide behind it. Yeah. And now it's like, you know, it's just, it's crazy, man. But like I, we, Dude, I try to avoid that stuff. Like um, w- one of the companies I helped start kill cliff uh, Chris Irwin was, uh, was the president of kill cliff and Chris Irwin was a who was seal team six. He was a gold squad guy. One of the smartest people I know book smart, one of the book smartest people I know. And when he started his social media, he said, I will never ever make a negative comment as long as I'm on these platforms. And uh, which I don't, I don't do that. I talk shit all the time, but like, I try to always remember <laughs> that. Like, I'm not going to argue with strangers. I'm not going to engage with people who are having a shitty day and want to go out there and cause someone else to have a shitty day. Like there's just life's too fucking short, man. Like um, I realized when I was 40 years old that I wasn't going to live forever. So I realized my mortality at the age of 40. And then like, um, you start thinking about life and you, you know, you're, my mom's 74, you know, and it's like, shit. And like my mother's boyfriend of 30 years, like is on his last leg. Like he's, I don't know if Jerry will make it another 30, 60, 90 days, who knows, but you start thinking about it. And, and, you know, and my buddy, Richard Ryan, he was like kind of, uh, philosophizing one night. And he said, if you were sitting on your deathbed, how much money would you pay to be doing what you're doing right now? And that is how the past three weeks I've started evaluating my time. If I was on my deathbed, would I pay to be doing what I'm doing right now? Fighting with some fucking jackass on the internet? Absolutely not. Living a, you know, a life, you know, enjoying my life and all that shit? Yes, I would pay to do that. And that's kind of how I started. That, that, that Richard said that to me three weeks ago. He was just telling me what he was. He was like, yeah, last night I was reading all this stuff and he's telling me what he's reading. And I was just like, holy shit, dude, that's pretty heavy, man. That really makes great sense. I'm going to take that advice. So I got on a rant back to meat hunting and, you know, harvesting does and things like that. Yeah, No, it's yeah. good, man. Cause that, that uh, whole, you know, Instagram, Facebook shit. It's uh, it's uh, I don't know, man. I, like I, I didn't never had an Instagram page or a Facebook page till I was till about a year and a half ago till I started this podcast and started this side little side gig focus on it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I have, I have to really push myself to go on Facebook or Instagram mostly because I just don't give a flying fuck what anybody else is doing outside my, my kids mm-hmm. and uh, how much money am my wife spending? <laughs> you know, I, I really don't give a shit who's doing what, who's shooting what with where, who, you know, who's doing it on public land, private land. I just don't give a shit. You know what I mean? Hunting's hunting to me. It's, it does, makes no difference. No, no, I agree with that. Um, I, I do it for like, so I do it for one entertainment purposes and I, I like to keep up with my friends. I've got to, you know, you hear a lot of guys say, keep your, keep your circle, keep your circle small, which I don't agree with my, I, my network of friends is freaking huge. And hopefully yeah, well, well, you're in the, you're in the marketing business too. So, I mean, you're kind of, yeah. you know, that's kind of part of your job. So. Yeah, but like I also really enjoy people. I enjoy interacting with people and I thoroughly, I truly, truly interact, I enjoy interacting with strangers. I really do. It is one of my favorite things. I like talking to people I've never met or seen and seeing if I can find common ground with them or, you know, find, you know, some something to talk about. Like, are they a college football fan? Do they hunt? Like, you know, they work out like they like to go fishing. Where do they live? Where are they from? Blah, 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 blah. Um, Cause it's just, I think it's interesting, but like I keep track of a lot of people and, you know, friends and like people like, you know, personal friends, internet friends, things like that. Um, and just kind of see like what everyone's doing. And like, you know, you just kind of, what I've learned lately is that people are just absolutely sick to death of uh, all the negative bullshit. 
It's like COVID this, face mask that, get a vaccine. You're all going to fucking die. Um, Trump's bad. This guy's worse. This is this politician's good. You know, and it's just like people are there's there's nothing positive on Fox News or CNN or MSNBC. Like no one's talking about anything positive. And I remember when I was in college, when Barry Bonds and Mark McGuire were chasing the home run record. And it was it was all over the nightly news. It was super positive. Like the country was rallying behind it and whatnot, you know, and then like we have the Olympics recently and like the Olympics are supposed to be like this great uniter. But like every single fucking dickhead had some social justice post or or protest to make. So the ratings were down 46 percent, you know, and then. um, Shit, I lost my train of thought. What was I about to say? Um, Whatever, it'll come to me. But. um, People are just sick of getting gaslit, you know, they want to they want to focus on positive stuff like, oh, but I was going to say, so like you've got all this sports stuff right now in the U.S. for the the California, the Angels, they have a pitcher named Shoei Otani. He's Japanese. And do you know anything about baseball? Uh, Not much outside the Toronto Blue Jays. Okay, but you know that pitchers aren't supposed to hit in the major leagues. They don't yeah. hit the ball. They get out. Yeah. They're guaranteed out. Okay. Well, Shoei Otani is one of he's an all star pitcher. He's one of oh, the best. Oh yeah. Okay. Sorry. Actually, he was he in the home run competition, the home run yeah. derby. Yeah. 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 He's yeah. leading the majors in home runs. Yeah. He, and he's yeah, that's insane. Yeah. 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 But no one's talking about that. Like honestly, this is arguably the greatest baseball player that has ever played the game, better than Babe Ruth. And like the, the, no one's talking about him on the media at all. And that's a positive thing. It's like, hey, like we got this Japanese dude who doesn't even speak a lick of English who's doing something that is not supposed to be done in baseball and doing both really well. It's crazy. So, yeah, like people are just sick of getting lit up on social media. They're sick of them being told what to do. They're sick of being told how to think. And, you know, and then you start to see that creep into other verticals. Um, of the hunting space. And like, I absolutely think that the whole locavore BHA meat eater cult that, you know, they've, they, they created this shit storm. So, and like yeah, I said, I, I feel I'm like that's big, probably you know, more. Big fan. Yeah. Well, I, I think that, yeah, like up here in Canada, I mean, obviously we get, uh, we get the meat eater on, on cable and I, I, uh, I think it's on Netflix or something. I don't, yeah. I, uh, I, I used to watch a lot of it before and then uh, it kind of, I just didn't appease to me too much anymore. And uh, same with the podcast. I, I listened to them, you know, maybe the first hundred, but then after that, I kinda, oh, I kinda religiously. And yeah. then it's just like, you know, the, the, but that's interesting. Like it's, it's challenging to always be on your a game. And when you're in the entertainment industry, whether you're a comedian, you're a comic, you're a writer, singer, songwriter, performer, you always have to be on your A game. And that's really, really hard. It's extremely hard um, to always put out A plus content. Cause like, you know, like if you put out A plus content, you got to put out A plus content because that's what people expect from you. And the moment that you hit a cold streak and you put out C plus comment or C minus comment or D con- content, I'm sorry, they're done with you. They're, they'll write you off and walk away. So it's hard. And then, then you have people's ego that factor into it. Mm-hmm. And it's like, Hey man, maybe take a break, let someone else take a stab at it. And, you know, go, you know, when you don't take a break, it's hard to recharge your creative juices. It's really challenging. So, um, you know, it's an interesting time out there on, in the social media landscape. Yeah, no doubt, man. Um, in general, yeah. yeah um, so a couple of things I want to talk to, I want to talk uh, more about your hunt trips coming up. Um, okay. But also, uh, I want to talk to I want to talk to you about a little bit about uh, Black Rifle Coffee Company. Um, right. So maybe maybe we could just hit that for go for it for, for a few minutes here. Just uh, you know, when did you like? Well, first of all, maybe we can just start out by just right. letting everybody know exactly what you do. I mean, I'll, I'll do a big uh, spiel in the intro. Kind of we kind of skip right past that, but maybe just let uh, the folks know from from your okay. what to, uh, what what you're up to. All right. So I started with Black Rifle, like in the very beginning, like the early days, like I I don't even think Black Rifle was a year old when I started hanging out and, you know, doing some consulting work. And so I was a paid consultant 
so Black Rifle, let's, so let's call it seven and a half years old. I was a consultant for like six years. Uh, and then I took a little bit more of a full-time role doing uh, other stuff for the brand. Um, and it's funny that you at, we're talking about this now because in, uh, what's today? The, so in seven days, I start as the um, community manager, director of Black Rifle Hunting uh, and Outdoor Strategy. Cool. So I'll be taking a much larger role in the company um, title and all that shit. Like I, I, we haven't decided that, but that, who gives a shit? Um, and then also I own a marketing company called Digital Mongoose and Digital Mongoose. I've got a couple of really talented employees that um, are just absolutely awesome. And so we run social media and consulting and marketing strategy, manage influencers for about two dozen brands in the outdoor space. Uh, Mossberg is biggest client. Fantastic company. Love those guys. Everly Stock, Leupold, PSE Bows, work with Kafaru, Killcliff, Yoked, um, Eastman's Hunting Journals, uh, Drinking Bros Podcast, American Party Podcast, uh, Black Rifle Coffee, Artifactor Factor Tactical, Mountain Primal Meat Company, Cortland Line, Gunbuyer.com, Everly Stock, Ready Gunner, Free Range American, and then I do Evan and Matt and Logan and JT's Twitter accounts as well. So super busy, but um, I got a really good system in place. Um, and like I said, really good employees. So super yeah, jacked. Evan there that you're talking about Evan uh, Schaefer, the, the founder. Yes. Right. See, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty, uh, yeah, pretty amazing story. The whole Black Rifle Coffee Company and, and kind of, you know, pretty amazing would, what, what he did. Or what oh, yeah, for so sure. Far. It's interesting. So like. One of the things that like with Black Rifle is like, you know, I've been, I've been running my own company this whole time and working for them. Um, and like, I would say I'm like in the inner circle of friends in the company, like I'm in the core group of friends, but I haven't been in like the core group, like on the inside of the business of the company, like, you know, Evan and Matt and those guys run that. Um, my phone rings, I answer it. They say, Hey, we need this da, 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 and I go do that. Or, Hey, I need to get in touch with this guy. I go find that person. Um, here's what I want to do. Okay. I'll make it happen. I need very little instruction. Um, but, and what's interesting is like, I've observed those guys for literally six, six and a half years now. And I think that I tell the story of the company better than anybody. Like Matt best says, I'm like a really good hype man. It's like, well, I'm not really, I'm not a hype man. I just, I, I can just, I, I tell the story really well. So what's interesting. So if you look at black rifle, Evan Hafer started that company with $1,800, all right, seven and a half years ago. And Black Rifle will do, I don't even know if I'm supposed to say this, but I don't really give a fuck. Um, Black Rifle will do two point, uh, 220 to 240 million in sales this year, all right? And we have a market valuation of $1.6 billion. So Evan Hafer, in his 44 years on this earth, has been a Green Beret. He managed programs for the CIA at the age of 29 in Northern Afghanistan. Pretty badass. And in eight years, started a company and turned it into a multi-billion dollar brand in eight years. So you got to think like, holy shit. Like, yeah, that's pretty gnarly. It, but, 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 but put yourself in his shoes for a second. What's going through his head? Like, like what's next? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Like, okay. Green beret. That's really hard to be. Okay. Oh, he's a great green beret. Work for the CIA. That's, that's really hard. I bet. Okay. He was really successful at that. Starts a coffee company, turns it into a multi-billion dollar brand in eight years. Oh fuck. Billionaire. Wow. That's, that's pretty hard. Well, he did that. So like, I don't know. He's just a really talented guy. And I think the thing that's really, that makes Evan, good at what he does is, and, and I hope he hears this. I don't know that he will. Um, Evan is not the smartest guy in the room. Not, not at all. He's absolutely not the most athletic guy in the room. He's not the most physically gifted guy in the room. Not at all. Evan has a, a world-class level of self-control and discipline. He has a phenomenal command and understanding of the English language. And 
this is the fucking scary part about him. If all it takes to become a subject matter expert in something is practice, everyone go ahead and get ready to be in second place. Because if all he has to do is practice at something to be good at it, then he's, he's not going to stop till he's great. And that's probably about as good a compliment as I could give someone in the world is like um, people that have tremendous levels of self-control and discipline, like really impress me. So like, this is going to make me sound like a cocky douchebag, but I, I don't want it to, but like, so um, I test really, really well on the intelligence spectrum. I, I just do. Like I, I'm very, very intelligent. I'm a very smart guy. I pick things up really quickly. My mother would tell you my IQ was something off the charts. She had me tested when I was a kid. I've always tested off the charts. Super fucking duper. All right. I was very genetically gifted. I was a very good athlete growing up. I played sports in college. I played semi-professional sports. Everything I've ever done has come really, really easy for me. It's nothing's ever really been challenging. Um, and like, I, I have the ability to go from like a novice, like picking up something day one to going to like advanced intermediate really, really quickly. And it's easy for me. The problem is I don't have the discipline or the self-control or discipline to take it to the next level. Does that make sense? Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I'm feeling. Yeah. So it's interesting. Like it's a, it's a blessing and a curse. So like, like you, you look at these kids, like, so for me, like in sports and I, and I just, I hope I'm not sounding like that guy, but I was always the fastest kid on the field. So I didn't need to pay attention and learn the plays in football. Like I didn't have to just keep, put the ball in my hands and I'll run, run by everybody. But when I got to college, I learned on the third day that I wasn't very good. I was just faster than everybody. But when I got to college, everyone was a lot faster than everyone else. I was still the fastest guy on the field. I just wasn't 10 steps faster. And I realized how little I actually knew about football. And so on the third day of college football, I learned that I was not a good college football player. I was a great high school football player. And that is where it ended. Um, so that's the thing about Evan, like everything Evan's ever had to do, he's had to work for it. Like, I don't think Evan's, Evan's a smart ass and he's really creative. I think creative stuff comes pretty easy to him. And I think making people laugh comes really easy because he grew up in like McCall, Idaho, bored as fuck, you know? So he had to find ways yeah. to entertain himself. Both good attributes as well. though. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But, but so here's the thing, like about those guys, like Black Rifle, I think our last eval was like 1.6 billion. I probably shouldn't be saying this, but who gives a shit? Um, yeah, you're, we're, we're up in Canada. For, yeah. yeah, so those guys like Evan and Matt and JT and Richard and like, and, and, and Logan, like none of them came from money. Like they didn't have a rich uncle that, that kicked them a few million dollars to start a company. Like they had, there were no shortcuts taken at all. Like Black Rifle Coffee is, is strictly the byproduct of their hard work. Yeah, I have watched it. it. I've watched them do it. I've watched them go without. I've watched Evan and his wife, you know, like him constantly gone. The marriage, you know, was was not easy all the time. Like it's perfect now and amazing. But like, you know, they went through some hard times, you know, with work and not having any money and shit. And he just sacrificed everything for the company. Um, they didn't cheat anybody. They didn't lie about anything. They didn't screw anybody over. They never took advantage of anyone. Like it's literally them and the hard work that they've put in. And that's super badass to see. Like they, they've never fucked anybody over. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's just been a rad experience to be a part of. Um, I'm extremely grateful. Um, and just to have been there, you know, from the early days, watching it all happen and, 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 and watching them grow. And, you know, what's interesting is like, so like the black rifle is it's, it's, it's Evan and, and then it's Matt. Okay. And, um, you know, so the, were those two guys tight before, uh, before they started, before Evan started the company? Or did they meet um, through the through the company? It's funny they actually. Uh, pretty, so Matt was a contractor for the CIA, uh, and I think Evan met Matt working for the agency. I, I don't know. Yeah. Matt doesn't talk about his time with the agency very much at all. Um, yeah, understandable. Um, I, but I but I but I think it's because Matt really fucking liked being an Army Ranger, and I don't think he really liked working for the CIA. 
Mm-hmm. Like, I think his whole thing, like, was like, he loved being an army ranger. Like he thought it was awesome. Um, uh, and what were we talking about? What was I saying? Oh, so, so Matt's super talented and like Matt, Matt does, he, you know, musically talented. He's really good at writing. He's phenomenal at like videoing and producing content and like his videos and the way that Matt has run the Invest 11 X social media platform, fucking flawless. Like, flawless didn't post too much didn't burn himself out like everything he did was just epic like he just crushed it um but the cool thing about matt though is like evan's growth and and maturing as a as a businessman and a ceo like you don't always see that but you see the results but you don't necessarily see the, the 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 maturation process Whereas Matt has a bunch of skills that you can see and hear and like feel and touch. Like, so Matt, and I would say this to his face, I used to think Matt was a shitty singer. I didn't think he was very good at all. I think Matt is a phenomenal singer now. And Matt has improved his vocals tremendously. And there are times when I don't know if it's Matt singing or JT, because JT's got pipes on him and it's, it's amazing. Um, Matt's instruments, uh, guitar and all that stuff have improved drastically. Uh, the drums drastically, like his video chops and his video production is phenomenal. And then also being able to watch Matt mature as a businessman, super badass. Like Evan will, will talk to 20 people about stuff. I call them Evan Hafer dress rehearsals, live fire drills, where like he'll go tell you to do something or he wants to do something. And you're like, does he really want me to do this? Or is he just talking to me? And then he's going to go talk to 20 other people. And then he'll come back to me and tell me to do it or not. Whereas Matt is much more thoughtful. And so Matt thinks things through. And then when Matt speaks, you're like, okay, I know he's thought this through. um, And this is what he wants. Whereas Evan, it's like, you're a part of his decision-making process. And Evan reserves the right to change his mind at any given time. Um, So it's, it's, it's just been, it's just been great, man. It really has been like, I'm so proud of those dudes and I'm just happy that they've let me hang out and, learn via osmosis so but yeah it's uh they're, they're a cool company they got uh some pretty uh some pretty good damn good coffee too um yeah and it's and also like my time with the company the company wasn't in a place for really for me to really have a profound impact on it until now now we're ready to expand into the hunting space and that's what i'm going to do um we're going full tilt boogie into the great outdoors so i'm pretty stoked cool man well uh so let's uh Let's hear a little bit about your uh, your elk hunt you got coming up. Is this your first elk hunt? Absolutely not. I'm the luckiest right. son of a bitch in the planet when it comes to elk hunting. Like, I've killed six, and I've shot nice. them all except for one on the first day. No shit. Shut uh, up. Dude, no. Seriously? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I don't have any, like, monster trophies. I think my biggest bull is, like, 305 inches. But that was public land, do it yourself. It's me by myself sitting on a water hole not having a clue what in the hell I was doing. I've only heard that from one other guy saying they, uh, and I had him on the show actually saying he got, uh, he got an elk on the first day. It's pretty impressive. Yeah. First elk. Here. Yeah. Wow. I've gotten five elk on the first day. Well, four and a half. So, um, let's hear about your first one. That was in Utah. Uh, two in Colorado. One in, second one was in Idaho. And then last year, uh, New Mexico. Yeah. So you're an Eastern boy. You grew up in Florida. <laughs> Uh, no, I grew up in Savannah, Georgia. Oh, Georgia. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. But it still, um, so not no elk hunting out there. I, I don't know. But so I grew up in Georgia and went to move to New York City and went to grad school at the age of 30, 32. Then I lived in Washington State for eight years. I lived in Mill Creek, just north of Seattle. Oh, yeah. So not too, uh, not too far not from too us. Far from me. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I, I just, my, my buddy I met in Africa, like, took me out to like a public land unit in a, in Utah. And I had my bow and we were, you know, hunting and he was like, I'm going to go with my daughter over to this water hole this afternoon. And I was like, what are you talking about? He's like, yeah, you're going to sit on this, 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 uh, this wallow. And I was like, in my head, I'm like, holy shit, what the hell? And then I was like, wait a minute, I'm just going to pretend it's a big elk, a big deer. And when it walks in broadside, I'm going to shoot it with an arrow. And, uh, Sure shit, man. Like I'd been there like maybe 30 minutes and I was waiting on the, um, the Georgia Notre Dame game to start. 
because I went to Georgia. I'm a diehard Georgia Bulldog football fan, and I and I despise Notre Dame. Like I fuck that program, <laughs> fuck them. I don't like them. I don't like anything about them. Um, and uh, I had I was roaming. I had like one bar, and I'd get a, a, a random text from my brother like every bit. I couldn't send anything out, no updates. And all of a sudden, I hear this noise that I have never heard in, in nature before. And I was like, what is that sound? I was like, it sounds like an animal or something playing around in a mud puddle. And I went, oh, shit, maybe that's an elk and a wallow. So I knocked an arrow and slipped down this meadow, and I got down to the base of the meadow, and I looked to my right, and I see a cow elk, I mean, a, a cow moose. And I thought, like, what I'm telling you right now all happened in about a quarter of a second, like really fast. And I thought, oh, that's what was making the noise. Wait a minute, that thing's dry. Number three, what a stupid looking animal. Like, what a silly, silly looking creature, you know? Cool, but silly looking. <clears throat> and then right in front of me, I just saw G1s coming up over this, hill and i thought oh fuck and when i say this elk was covered in mud like shit was dripping off his horns oh yeah, like, yeah they, they caked themselves in that yeah, yeah. Dude, it, he was it was it, he was it was comical and i just saw i saw the g1s and i thought i'm gonna shoot this elk like i'm not i don't need to look at his racket i don't need to look at anything i'm shooting this elk and at the base of the meadow was this big old pine tree that had fallen down and was basically blocking the entrance into the meadow. And so he hung a, my left, his right, and walked down that tree. And I was like, if he walks like 30 more feet, there's my opening and that's my shot. And um, sure as shit, dude, he walked to that opening and opened his shoulder up for me, stopped, stood there. And I let an arrow fly. And it took hit both lungs. Um, and, you know, like I'm sitting there and I'm by myself and I always hunt with someone. I just enjoy hunting with people, my friends. And I was like, oh, my God. And I looked down and my leg was just jackhammering. And for some stupid reason, I pulled out my phone and recorded my leg shaking. And then I was like, man, what am I doing? I'm an idiot. This is embarrassing. So I put my phone up and I'm just kind of like standing there and like looking around and like, what the hell do I do now? And then I was like, all right. I'm going to wait, you know, 30, 45 minutes like they do on the hunting TV shows. And I waited about 10 seconds and then I walked over to where the elk was just to it see. It felt if like I, 45 I mean, minutes. though. I bet always does. No, 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 no. I realized I was like, yeah, like I, was, I was telling you like self-control and discipline and patience. Oh, and shit. Like, I, I, was like, I was like, I'll just walk over there and see if I see the arrow. <laughs> and the whole time I'm thinking I missed, you know, self-doubt, even though I drilled his ass. And I walk over there and I was like, motherfucker, man, like, I bet I missed this fucker or I gut shot him. I, I went from I knew I hit him. I, I, I came to grips with the fact that I had hit him, but I defaulted to always oh, probably a gut shot. Just, you know, whatever. Like who who from the south ever thinks they're going to kill an elk? You know what I mean? Like, is this ha is this real? At least I was like, cool. At least I shot it when I saw one, you know. Uh, and so I get over there and I'm looking around. And I looked to my left in the direction he ran and it, dude, it was a haunted house of blood. There was blood eight feet in the air. A two-year-old could attract this elk. So I walked about 85 yards. And when I say, dude, like, I'm not trying to be gross or anything, but like, dude, the amount, there was blood pouring out oh, yeah. of every mouth, everything. Yeah. Do you use uh, mechanical or uh, fixed broadheads? Well, on that, that, that was a mechanical on that one. Oh, yeah. But I, yeah. So. Um, no, 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 oh, I'm sorry. No, that was a stinger. That was a, that was a, that was a two blade stinger, stinger. With, oh, yeah. with, ble with bleeder blades on it. Oh yeah. Those will mess you up. Yeah. So I, what was interesting is it went in on his left side and hit his right front shoulder and bounced back. Oh yeah. Devastating. For sure. So anyway, so, so I go 85 yards and like i'm like dude like i'm i don't i'm walking around it because i don't want to get the blood all over my pants like it, it was absurd and then all of a sudden he gets to this clearing and like the blood stops and what happened was the elk had been running and he just stopped running all right and my massive blood trail went from like an insane amount of blood to like i remember i was telling you he was covered in mud yeah i found a dripping where the blood and the mud had mixed. Oh yeah. 
And I was like, oh, fuck, I got shot in. Back to, you know, back, yeah, back. Yeah. I, I, had, I had regressed from like power stroke to, oh, I fucked this up. And he was dead 10 feet away from me. Oh, nice. <laughs> Dude, it was wild. And like, you know, the thing, man, I was like, I was like, no matter what happens to me the rest of my life, no one can take this away from me. I killed an elk by myself with a bow. Yeah, man, your first dog's pretty sweet, especially with the, uh, with the. Oh, bow. dude, it was completely. Well, I mean, dude, like, and it was like I was hunting broadside elk. Like I wasn't hunting a bull. I was hunting whatever, a cow, calf. Yeah. I didn't give a shit. And so, and then you know, packed him out. My buddy came over and we cleaned him and all this stuff and. Um, you know, finally packing him out and we're like, I don't know, seven, eight miles in some steep country. But all this while, like I'm getting sporadic texts from my brother, like Georgia's winning, Notre Dame's winning, we're winning. They took the lead again. And then like I lost signal and they were up by a point or something like that. And I was like, man, I don't, I'm not a religious person. I don't pray very much. I was like, but God, like if I could just, if we could beat Notre Dame, and I, I killed this elk, which I'm grateful for. But like, if we could just beat Notre Dame, like that'd be the best day ever. And so we get to the bottom of the Canyon and we're driving out, man. And my phone lights up and, um, like everyone's like, congrats. And I'm like, how'd they know I killed an elk? <laughs> and then my buddy, Chris Rosa, who's, uh, uh from California, he went to, he went to Cal. He was like, great win. And I was like, Oh my God, we beat, we beat Notre Dame too. What a great day. Oh, nice. Yeah. So it was, dude, it was good it day. Was, yeah, oh, yeah, for sure. So cool. Now you're hunting them uh, in Colorado. You ever you have you hunted Colorado before? I have. Yeah, I've, I've yeah. taken an elk there. Um, oh, nice. A raghorn, yeah. a raghorn, not a good one. No, it's just a raghorn. Yeah. Still a little um, tougher elevation there. You got to worry about. So yeah, um, this place. So like, I have this kind of theory in my head of like. So I dude, I could go buy some super expensive tag and go shoot a monster elk. Like I, I could, I, I have the ability to do that. I can do that. I'm just not that person though. Like I don't want someone to come into my house and see like a 275, a 305 inch elk and then see like a 375. You know what I mean? Like yeah. there's a, and, and this just applies to me. I don't put this on other people. It's just me personally. I want to, look at everything in my house on my walls, you know, and, and know that I did it the right way and I kind of earned it. So like where I'm going this year is the, the hall ranch, which is a phenomenal, epic, epic spot rifle hunt last week of September. They're like, you will have, you'll see multiple three fifty plus bulls, which to me is just like, Holy shit. You know what I mean? And I think I'm ready, knock on wood. I'm ready for that. Last year in New Mexico, I had two 360s that we were after, and I just needed one of them to take four more steps, and he wouldn't do it. And so final day, I set, settled on a lesser bull. Uh, old as shit, broken off, you know, tines and whatnot, bruiser. Character. So I'm pretty I'm, – I'm excited about this year. Like, I really am. Like, this will be – from with regards to elk, like, this will be my first, like – legit legit going after a, a, a trophy like focused on a big elk right you know not just a broadside elk not a not a bull but like a big big elk like i am going after a monster for me yeah cool should be a good time now yeah, uh, I'm pretty jazzed about it florida you uh you get to hunt turkey out in florida uh so do you hunt turkey out in florida i guess obviously you do i of all the things that I do, I think I'm probably the best at turkey hunting. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I killed a lot of them in a lot of different states, um, a bunch of truckloads. And I went Osceola hunting for the first time, true Osceola in South, South Florida this year with PSE bows uh, and my buddy Jeremy Starks, who's a wildlife biologist. And let me tell you, they're not like other turkeys. They don't gobble. They don't make any noise. Um, they, they live in the thickest, nastiest, gnarliest shit you have ever seen. It is, it, they live in stuff that's so thick and nasty that other turkeys wouldn't even, like an Eastern turkey wouldn't fly over oh, yeah. the habitat. Those, cause, and, and the reason they don't gobble is because e around every corner is an ambush spot for them. 
Like yeah, there's that's, a, that's a, like a the Miriams we hunt up here. We gotta they hunt in the high hills. You gotta be in shape. Mm-hmm. And uh it's a lot of running up and down hills chasing those fucking birds. But they uh I've taken I've you know I, I've gotten a few, I gotten four in my life, but they're uh I didn't get one this year and I was ready to give up on uh on turkey hunting, but uh oh dude, I love turkey hunting. Like I it is I think it's freaking awesome. And anyone that yeah. doesn't like it can kiss me right square in the crack of my ass. Yeah, man. It's uh it's a lot of fun for sure. It's uh what about uh you, you ever hunt uh spring black bear? That's the one animal that has whooped me pretty good. So I've 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 been black bear hunting a few times and I've never ever been able to close the deal. No kidding, eh? No, no, just bad, super bad luck on them. Like just shit luck. Crazy. Yeah, we have uh we've got I mean we've got too many black bears up here. You should come up here and hunt. Yeah, I, I should. That's what everyone says that BC is the spot. Yeah, yeah. It uh, but then again, for an out of state, I mean it's crazy what we have to go through for in BC anyway, for uh, guys uh, just out of province, never mind, uh, you know, out of the country for you guys to come up here, you have to go through an outfit. Uh, our buddy Sam Ayers just texted me. He said, uh, ask Baker about uh, pig testicles. No, that's disgusting. <laughs> okay. That was when I was hunting Osceola turkeys with Jeremy <laughs> Starks, West Virginia ass and Caleb Sorrells from PSE. And uh shooting the pigs was epic it was an epic ending to a failed attempt at turkey hunting uh put on a long stalk wind was perfect like shot one with a bow one with a crossbow and then i had a shot <laughs> shot one right in the show uh right in the shoulder um with a three and a half inch winchester long beard uh and just drilled it but um so Jeremy was like, you ever had pig testicles? And it's like, no, but, you know, we'll try it. And so he cooked one up and it looked oh. delicious, sliced it up. How did he cook it? Like, On a grill. Oh, he just <laughs> he barbecued it. Well, he or sliced it. Pepper, I think it was peppers and onions, like an aluminum foil. And, um, yeah, it grilled it on like a hot plate looking thing and uh, a skillet. And, uh, like, I took a – I don't – listen, man. Like, I don't spit food out. Like, I'm not an immature child. Like, you know, that I had to spit out. I just, I got the end piece and it looked like a little, like a butthole kind of. Um, and it was just nasty and the texture sucked. And I got spit it out. And then Caleb, I looked over at Caleb and he just shaking his head. And he's like, yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, that, that's a no for me. I don't know. And, and Jeremy was saying that he was like, yeah, I think it's delicious. He's like, I could eat these like all the time, you know? Oh, uh, so what did it taste like? Is there anything you can uh, like, like, Oh, I couldn't even imagine. No, the, the flavoring was excellent. It's just really? the, te- the texture was really, really gnarly. Oh yeah. It was just, fuck, man, like just nasty as shit. Um, but Jeremy's from West Virginia and those people are weird and they do weird shit. And like, I just, but uh, that makes me want to barf yeah yeah no doubt so no more uh no more pig testicles that's funny yeah no no <laughs> never again not ever no not you you couldn't pay me to eat one yeah no doubt man but uh, i'm gonna ask you one more i just want to talk about one more thing here and uh mm-hmm. and we'll wrap this up here the uh, hunter recruitment program you guys still uh you guys still got that rolling mm-hmm. yep we sure do um we've got our first hunt uh whitetail hunt coming up in october one in November, one in December. We're doing a duck in January. Uh, last year we did one in Jan. We we did uh, in 2021. We we did a whitetail in January. We did a fly fishing trip in April. We did a work party in June, um, and then I think we'll, we, we might take a couple people whitetail hunting mm-hmm. with bows in September at the farm. But um, yeah, we've got like a vegan ultra runner that's coming in in October, uh, we've got a couple of writers, um, a couple of black rifle employees. Um, November is going to be Nicole and her dad, um, who hasn't hunted in like 30 years. And then it's just, yeah, it's going to be cool. Well, I'm really excited about it. And I think we'll do like a waterfowl in January. We've got like three or four whitetail deer ones coming up, um, uh, this fall. Yeah. Cool. So, so, uh, real quickly, what is the hunter recruitment program for those who don't know? So we take people 
hunting that have never been uh, or haven't been in like 10 or 15 years. So it's retention, recruitment. Uh, that's kind of the, what we're going after is um, getting people out there. And, you know, we can't guarantee that you're going to like killing a deer, but I can guarantee you that you'll get a taste of success. And once you've had success in hunting, you'll know immediately if you want to do it again or not. Yeah. Yeah. So do you guys get more of, of new hunters who have never hunted or more oh, of people who, sure. who just haven't gone in a long time? No, it's new hunters. Like we, yeah. I hand, we hand, I hand pick everybody. Oh, is that right? So, yeah. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's great, man. It's huge success. Um, Everly. So black rifles, our title sponsor, Everly stock is our presenting sponsor. So this year, everyone's going to get like a full kit and Everly stock, the camo Sick. pack, uh, Leupold provides glass, um, sunglasses, mountain primal provides meat. Um, it just, it's going to be awesome, man. I cannot wait. Yeah. That's cool. Man. How many, how many guys do you take? So what is it like? We'll do seven hunters and seven mentors. Oh, I see. Kid. I got you. Okay, cool. And now you get a lot of applicants or is that the process? People have to fill an application and no, then you just kind of go I, through. I, I just, Oh, you hand. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I, Every, because we're new and you know i i handpick everyone like we're not in a position where we can take chances with random people showing up right yeah um so i handpick every single person that comes for the yeah. most part jamie 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 picks a couple people but most of them are my connections or people that i know yeah how many years have you guys have been doing this now mm, november will be one year oh right on. not even a cool. year oh yeah brand new man Cool. We just cool. started it. Yeah. And it's just been a tremendous success. Yeah. Right on. Yeah. I heard, uh, heard you and, uh, you and Brian talking about it on, uh, yeah. Eastman's elevated there. So cool. Yeah. That's who I'm hunting with in Colorado is. Oh, Eastman. is that right? Yeah. Yeah. That'd be fun. Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty jazzed. Yeah. Good hunter. That guy. Okay, man. Yeah, uh, good. I'm gonna let you go. It's, uh, it's pushing on an hour here. I'd like to keep it under an hour. I know you got lots to do and, uh, I'm sure there's somebody going to be screaming at me somewhere. So uh, thanks for coming on the show, buddy. I appreciate it. Have a great day. Thank you. Yeah. Later. Bye.